Thank you. Can you hear me? I guess so. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Simon and um, I'm a psychologist from Copenhagen uh, and I did my master's thesis about um, people's morally inconsistent relations with other animals. Uh, and now I'm working as a project manager on a Danish 22-day uh, vegan challenge campaign. And what I'm going to talk about today is um, how we can use uh, psychological uh, insights uh, and transform them into um, the more practical aspects of activism with the Vegan Challenge campaign as uh, an example of this. And uh, the program for my speak is as follows. Uh, first, I'm going to present what is moral inconsistency, what does it look like? Uh, and then the second part, I'm going to uh, bring in the psychological theories uh, in order to try to explain why we are morally inconsistent. And in the third part, um, I'm going to, um, to try and see how we can, uh, what we can do to overcome people's uh, moral inconsistency. So first of all, what does moral inconsistency look like? And I think this, uh, the colors are a bit uh, off, but uh, I hope you can see it still, because I think this uh, drawing uh, sums it up quite nicely. Um, it shows basically that um, people love animals, uh, but people at the same time also eat animals. Uh, so definitely people love some animals, but, uh, but also uh, take part in eating other animals. So I have some very delicious uh, looking meat <laughs> that I <laughs> wanted to present to you. Um, but despite how uh, disgusting this meat looks, um, the global consumption of meat is, uh, has never been higher as, uh, it, as it is today. Uh, and this could imply that people basically don't really care about animals since they eat so many animals. But as most of us know, uh, this is definitely not true. People uh, also really do care about animals. And um, at the same time, we have seen a comparative rise in the expenses that people spend on their companion animals. Uh, and most, uh, most people actually regard their companion animals as equal family members. We also have pet cemeteries uh, for our companion animals when they die. Um, and we also see uh, people have really um, strong uh, moral outrage uh, whenever um, certain animals are killed uh, and, and the stories hit the media, like for example, uh, the killing of uh, Marius the baby giraffe in the uh, Copenhagen Zoo. Uh, we have Cecil the lion, uh, the pilot whales in the Faroe Islands. And most of the people who react so genuinely uh, empathetic and compassionate uh, and get outraged by the killing of, um, of these animals, uh, most of them on a daily basis also support uh, the killing of many other animals through their consumption of meat. Um, and this um, relates to what psychologists have uh, called the meat paradox that people love animals, but people also love meat, uh, which I think this sums up. So uh, I hope you have an idea of what moral inconsistency is, and now I'm going to talk about why we are uh, morally inconsistent. So we like to think of ourselves as these super rational and logical uh, beings um, that would, uh, yeah, I mean, who wouldn't agree with, uh, with what uh, Spock is saying here? Um, but in reality, we often uh, see quite the opposite. We see that we are actually, um, I don't know if you had time to read it, or else you get one more second. But in fact, we are actually destroying our home planet. Uh, we do lots of irrational things. We, um, we are smoking, we are eating unhealthy food. Uh, we are not using um, seat belts when driving, not using helmets when uh, biking, uh, not exercising, all these things that we know are good for us, but still uh, many of us uh, are not doing them. Um, and I think this uh, illustrates the clash between uh, what is our ideal self and what is often um, our more um, realistic uh, self. So the first answer to the question, why are we morally inconsistent, uh, is because we are simply not as rational as we like to think we are. And in questions of morality, uh, psychologists now uh, pretty much agree that um, emotions and intuitions come first and only afterwards comes uh, rational thinking and reasoning. And this rational uh, reasoning is highly biased since its primary functioning is actually to justify uh, our 
um, initial uh, emotional um, feeling or gut feeling that something is either right or wrong or good or bad. Um, so, yeah, the rational reasoning is not very objective uh, indeed. And I think uh, this um, model illustrates this um, quite well. Uh, I apologize for the speciesist uh, connotations, but uh, it's called the elephant rider model. Uh, and we see we have the rider, which um, is um, our ideal self, the rational, um, analytical, foresighted, uh, logical part of our brain that can plan ahead and um, think of the best uh, way to do things and what is, what is the best thing to do. But then uh, underneath we also have uh, the elephant, uh, which is actually much more powerful. Uh, and the elephant is uh, our irrational, uh, emotional side that uh, seeks uh, immediate gratification uh, of our desires. And I bet you could imagine if there is a conflict of interest between the rider and the elephant, uh, it's not that difficult to imagine uh, which one will win. Um, and then the third thing we have is the path, uh, which is uh, the surroundings and the context uh, that the person uh, lives in. Um, yeah, and I'm going to get back uh, to this uh, model later on. Um, but in psychology, and I, I believe in, in the general public as well, there has been a lot of reliance on, on the rider, on our uh, ability to, uh, to reason and to be rational. Um, but uh, unfortunately, this rationality is uh, quite flawed, with, which I'm going to uh, illustrate with an example. Um, some psychologists, they made a study uh, where they um, had participants fill out a questionnaire about um, anim different animals' uh, cognitive capabilities as well as uh, moral value. Uh, and the trick in the study was that half of the participants um, before filling out this questionnaire, uh, they um, were served a, a bowl of uh, beef jerky and the other half of the participants were served a bowl of uh, nuts. Um, and the results shown that the participants who had just been eating the meat from a cow, not only did they judge uh, cow's mental capabilities and moral value as lower than the group that had just been eating nuts did, uh, but actually their lower concern um, for animals' moral value spread to all animals in general. Um, and I think this shows us that, first of all, um, our morality is not uh, based on um, rationality, since uh, what we have just been eating shouldn't uh, be able to influence our moral judgments. And furthermore, I think this also illustrates that um, what our rational reasoning is doing is, uh, is not so much uh, trying to find an objective truth, uh, but is more um, invested in trying to justify our previous behaviors. So you could say that, okay, it's not because we don't uh, care about certain animals that we eat those animals, it's rather because we don't care because we eat the animals. I don't know if that got through, but uh, <laughs> hopefully. Mm. Okay, so we see that um, a lot of uh, different things and factors can interfere with our ability to uh, rational reasoning. Uh, and it's definitely not an objective um, thing for us. It's, it's rather highly motivated and strategic uh, when trying to find out uh, facts. So this means that basically we cannot really rely on the writer um, if, we, um, if we want to try and make people less morally inconsistent. Uh, and that means that we need to focus on motivating uh, the elephant. And we do this by awakening people's emotions. And in the case of animals, uh, awakening or uh, ev evoking empathy for animals. And empathy is uh, a very strong incentive uh, to act in accordance with our moral, um, our abstract moral values like justice and care, for example. Um, and I think similar to um, that we like to imagine ourselves as super rational beings, I think many of us, maybe, maybe especially uh, in this room animal rights people, we like to think of ourselves as really compassionate beings, uh, all loving creatures like uh, this uh, care bear. Um, and in some cases, we actually are, because humans are genuinely uh, compassionate and we feel empathy and uh, we can be altruistic and, and we actually feel distress when others are suffering uh, because we, we do care about their well-being. But that's not always the case, unfortunately, because empathy is a limited resource uh, and we cannot be empathetic with all beings at all times. 
Uh, and furthermore, our empathy also suffers from, from some systematic and uh, structural biases, uh, limits and flaws. One of the flaws or limits that uh, we have is the familiarity bias. And this means uh, that it's much easier for us to empathize uh, with someone who is uh, similar to us because it doesn't really require any, uh, any effort for us to, uh, to imagine what the world might look from their eyes. Uh, and we instantly and automatically uh, feel their pain, for example, if, if we meet a chimpanzee that's, that's suffering. But if we encounter, for example, a spider, then the story is totally different because, um, yeah, it takes much more of an and willful uh, effort to try to imagine what the world might look from a spider's point of view. And, and it's much more difficult for us to empathize uh, with a spider. And this leads me to, to a question I want to ask you. Um, how many of you went uh, vegan primarily out of moral concern uh, for the bees? Because you, you felt like this, <laughs> or this, um, and I, I'm, I'm not saying this uh, to point out that we shouldn't care about bees or that bees have no moral value, uh, but the point I'm trying to make is that um, I saw no one raise their hand, so I, I, I guess you have the same feeling as I do, that it is uh, simply more difficult for us to empathize with uh, bees um, because they're so different um, from us. And another limit of empathy is also that um, besides uh, the familiarity bias, uh, many ways that activates our empathy, they also require that uh, we have a face-to-face -face interaction with another individual. And in most cases where uh, people encounter other animals uh, in their everyday lives is when they eat the animals uh, and then there are is no longer an individual uh, to be face to face with. And this means that people don't really get their emotional or empathetic buttons uh, pushed in the same way as they do, for example, uh, with their uh, dog who is a living subject uh, in their everyday lives. And this also means that um, if um, yeah, this makes it totally uh, possible for people without feeling any moral dilemmas to uh, pet their dog at the same time as they're eating a hot dog. Um, but if hot dogs actually look like this, then it would be much easier for us to get people to, to empathize um, with the animal uh, and, and to make people stop doing it. Furthermore, our empathy also suffer from uh, anthropocentric bias, which means that we have a tendency to favorize the human uh, and to use the human as the metric to measure uh, everything else with. Uh, and as this uh, drawing um, illustrates, um, often it's, uh, it's not very fair to use the same uh, metric to, to measure everything in the world with. One study uh, carried out by some psychologists uh, was trying to measure people's uh, empathetic distress when they were watching um, footage of uh, different animals uh, suffering. And this was uh, both uh, human and non-human animals. Um, and the results were that uh, people um, felt more uh, distressed, it was more uncomfortable for them to watch uh, the footage, uh, the more genetically similar the animals were uh, to the human uh, with humans uh, at top. And this was both on an unconscious level that was measured by people's uh, sweat response and also on a conscious level where people were uh, filling out a questionnaire afterwards. And I think this is uh, pretty important because it tells us that we as animal rights activists, we have some uh, special uh, challenges, uh, I think, compared to other social justice issues, because um, as we can see, um, people care simply less about um, animals that are uh, less similar to us. And even though we know from psychology that, that we also have some um, um, uh, sexist and racist biases uh, in empathy, uh, the speciesist and anthropocentrist biases are even more profound since uh, the other animals are even lower on the um, moral ladder than um, other human beings who have a different uh, gender or uh, ethnicity than ours. Um, and what makes it even more problematic, I think, is that uh, the animals that we eat the most and who suffer the most in the industry 
uh, are also the animals that uh, we uh, empathize the least with, which is uh, chickens and, and fish. Um, so this is uh, a real um, challenge. And this also means that uh, since we cannot really uh, rely on, uh, on, on the elephant, we also need to focus on shaping uh, the path and creating uh, a social and cultural, cultural uh, environment where it's easier uh, for the elephant to walk uh, the path. And this brings me to the third part, uh, which is uh, yeah, about how can, we, how can we do this? How can we make people uh, less morally inconsistent? Mm. Yeah, and um, as I um, was um, starting to sum up, um, so we have seen we cannot really rely on the rider because even though the rider is important for um, setting the goals and setting the direction, uh, our rationality has some flaws. Uh, and the elephant, uh, the emotions are more important uh, and, um, and definitely some, something we should focus on, but, but the elephant is also uh, flawed due to some limits of our empathy. So this means that uh, we should focus on the path and, uh, and this is exactly uh, what we're trying to do with, uh, with the Vegan Challenge campaign. Uh, but before I get to that, um, I'm going to uh, give you a short example from my own uh, experiences of, uh, of uh, being an activist. Because when I started out doing animal rights activism uh, many years ago, um, I had this idea that I was uh, convinced purely by rational arguments and uh, that if I presented uh, the same rational arguments, the animal rights philosophy to other people, uh, then that would um, instantly turn them into vegans. I had this idea that the only thing that really separated uh, the average person from veganism was uh, a lack of knowledge or a lack of uh, rational arguments. And I mean, if it was true that we were these super rational logical machines, then of course it would make sense to just, as this uh, drawing illustrates, just put uh, knowledge and rational uh, philosophical arguments into people's heads and then they would um, be vegan afterwards. But as I've shown you, that's uh, unfortunately not the case. Actually, the opposite often happens because studies have shown that uh, rational arguments can sometimes even have a backfire effect because uh, if you step into the um, the battleground of, um, of uh, moral arguments, then uh, people um, can become very defensive uh, because they feel like you challenge the whole worldview, uh, and then actually it might end up with them believing even stronger in their own um, beliefs uh, than they did before, even though you come with uh, what is uh, objectively uh, more correct or factual. Um, so, uh, yeah, so unfortunately it wasn't as simple as I thought, and I realized that after uh, spending years of uh, banging my head against the wall uh, with uh, Peter Singer's Animal Liberation in Hand and trying to um, convince people that they should read it. Um, but yeah, it's much more complex uh, and this uh, drawing is to illustrate that it's uh, as much about all these um, contextual factors uh, that actually stands between uh, the average uh, non-vegan and uh, veganism. Uh, and these are all the factors that we try to actively address in the Vegan Challenge campaign. Um, and I'll, I'll now try and go through some of the most important factors that we have, um, we have found. And the first factor is uh, this lack of knowledge because definitely it is um, something that we need to address. And we also do this in the campaign uh, by trying to provide people with facts about uh, the animal industry and, and also um, um, some uh, animal rights uh, philosophical um, points, but we do this only gradually during the 22 days uh, and it only takes up a small part of the campaign. Another thing we also try to address is people's apathy and we try to turn this into empathy of course to make people uh, care about animals and, and relate to animals and, and this also um, uh, takes um, a place in our campaign but, but again uh, we do it gradually and we focus mainly on, on videos uh, and stories about individual animals uh, that uh, studies have shown is much easier for people to connect to uh, than if you um, show them statistics and, and stuff like that. Um, but again, uh, our main focus in the campaign is on the how to be vegan rather than the why uh, vegan because this is of really great importance since studies have shown 
um, that 84% of uh, vegans and vegetarians, they eventually turn back to eating meat. Uh, and it's not because people uh, suddenly come to some rational uh, realization that animals actually do not have any moral value or that they emotionally just realize, nah, I don't care about animals at all. Um, it's rather because um, there are some um, obstacles in their um, everyday lives, social, cultural obstacles. Uh, and that's why we try to focus mostly on those. Um, and some of the most important are a fear of bad food. Uh, and this might sound uh, trivial to us because uh, most of us, if, especially if we have been vegan for some time, we know that vegan food is uh, just as delicious, if not more. Um, but still, this is a serious concern for many and we, we shouldn't neglect it. Um, and what we do in the campaign is simply just to provide recipes for people, provide uh, grocery shopping lists and tips for where people can get uh, meat alternatives uh, and help them with... Um, we, have a, we have a closed Facebook group uh, for all the participants with a lot of uh, volunteer mentors that guide uh, the participants. And we also have a personal mentor system uh, where people can write one-on-one -on -one with the mentors and get advice. So people can actually, if they have a favorite dish that they are afraid of uh, never eating again, then we can help them with trying to find a vegan uh, substitute for that. Another factor is the lack of social support or fear of sticking out. Uh, and again, uh, this is a serious concern for many uh, because no one wants to be uh, that guy. Um, and we, we, as I said, we have a closed Facebook group uh, for all the participants, which uh, is exactly to try to address this, that we give people uh, a social community, a network of other vegans um, from, from the beginning, and they also have this personal uh, mentor that they can um, talk to. And I think a side effect is also that by getting a lot of people to try and take a vegan challenge, even though it's just uh, a small amount of time, and not all people who go through the challenge go vegan, but just having a lot of people try to eat vegan for a period, that will also spread and make it more uh, socially acceptable to eat vegan uh, for other people. Um, yeah. And another factor is also uh, fear of bad health, um, which again um, might seem um, strange for us because we know that it's uh, perfectly healthy to be vegan and um, maybe often even healthier. Uh, but again, this is a serious concern for many, and not the least because their doctor might tell them that um, they shouldn't go vegan and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's also very important that um, that we address these uh, health issues because there, unfortunately, there is a lot of uh, pseudo-scientific um, facts or yeah, non-facts uh, floating around. I've seen it in at least in Denmark and in the vegan Facebook group, stuff like uh, people advising other vegans not to take B12 supplements, uh, uh, which can be very, um, first of all, uh, unhealthy for the person who, who gets the advice, but also can harm the whole movement because people get sick uh, and then they... Um, it, this idea of uh, veganism as being uh, not uh, nutritional spreads to their social network and yeah, that's really uh, harmful, I think. So that's why in the campaign we have a, cl a clinical dietitian uh, who's the only one who has the authority to give uh, nutritional and health uh, advice to the participants. And then there's uh, the last factor, which is inconvenience, uh, which again, for some of us, might seem like a trivial uh, concern. Uh, but yeah, we might even think that it's easy to be vegan and easy to go vegan, but we shouldn't neglect this because for most people it is seriously difficult to change your habits. It's, um, yeah, it takes a lot of work to, to change uh, what you have been doing for, I don't know, the 20 years, 30 years, 50, <laughs> no matter how old you are. Um, and what we do in the campaign is that we focus on uh, making veganism easy for people to do. Uh, and we do it, first of all, by providing all these uh, recipes, tips, uh, info. We, we try to collect it all in one place so they don't have to uh, shop around on, on the whole internet. And we also do it with the personal mentor system, uh, which people are very happy about. Um, but furthermore, we also um, do it by um, tr presenting the whole um, campaign as a vegan challenge rather than presenting it as, as a starter um, guide to, to being vegan or going vegan. Because uh, by presenting it just as a 22-day challenge, 
uh, it requires uh, less of a commitment for people and it, it seems more doable for people uh, and it's also easier for people to, uh, to succeed and actually have an experience of success uh, if they complete the 22 days and eventually many people also continue after the 22 days. But secondly, uh, we also do this uh, by loosening up on the veganism uh, definition uh, by, um, yeah, in order for making it easier for people. And this means that uh, we have a loose, uh, non-dogmatic approach to veganism where we only focus uh, on the food and the challenge. Uh, we don't focus on cosmetics or clothes. Uh, and with the food, we only focus on uh, meat, dairy and eggs uh, and not honey. Um, and some of you might um, be critical about this and ask um, if it isn't problematic uh, to not tell people the whole truth uh, from the beginning. Uh, but I tend to disagree about this because uh, imagine if a person is uh, willing to take this substantial uh, and huge step to really change their habits uh, and to make uh, a huge impact for the environment and for the animals and maybe go 99% of the way. What do you think happens if uh, someone comes up to them and keep telling them that that's not good enough, you need to include this and you need to include this or else you're just a hypocrite or you're not part of the club or you're not being good enough. Um, I have the idea that this is not very motivating for people and I feel that instead of getting a lot of people to go 99% of the way, um, we if we insist on getting them to go the last 1%, then I think we might end up uh, having far fewer people going uh, any of the way at all. And I think especially when it comes to uh, honey, as I also showed you earlier, um, I think we need to take into account that far most of the population uh, think that it's ridiculous uh, to care about bees or uh, insects uh, at all. And I'm not saying that uh, they're right about this, but I think we need to take it into account. And I think there also are some uh, qualitative differences between uh, honey and, and the other parts of the animal industry. First of all, because scientists are still uh, disagreeing about uh, bees sentience and secondly um, because I think it's pretty safe to say that um, if bees are sentient then still um, there is far less suffering in the honey industry than many of the other uh, animal um, industries. So um, I think yeah it's definitely better to acknowledge uh, at this point that people don't really care about bees uh, and instead um, focusing on the people, no, focusing on the things that they actually do care about now in order to get them on board. But unfortunately, uh, some vegans um, who seem to always find into our uh, closed Facebook groups, they, they have this idea that the most important thing to people to care about is e-numbers. Um, and we, we try to, um, to create a very uh, non-judgmental and open and accepting atmosphere in the Facebook groups. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it always happens that uh, some uh, vegans get into the group and, and then they're ready to point out whenever uh, a participant uh, accidentally uh, has bought a chocolate uh, with maybe a microgram of some ingredient that might or might not be of animal origin. Uh, and I find this very unfortunate because, um, first of all, uh, I don't really believe it's going to make a difference in the world at all if uh, people buy a chocolate with like a tiny, tiny microgram of skimmed milk powder. That's never going to tip the system uh, in either direction. And second of all, also because all the things I've uh, presented to you today, uh, it's not possible to be 100% uh, morally uh, consistent. Uh, so I think it's, uh, it's not a good thing to strive for something that is uh, impossible because um, it uh, gives people uh, an experience of failure and it also portrays veganism as unnecessarily uh, difficult and impossible to live up to. Mm. Oh. Okay. Come on. Okay. Um. Ah. Okay. Um, and besides, there are also some uh, serious positive side effects of, um, of making a more non-dogmatic and uh, loose approach to veganism because um, when we don't require people to, to buy in on the whole ideological package of uh, animal rights philosophy and don't require them to, to buy an, 
a whole ebook, uh, no e number guidebook um, to to get started. Then, uh, and if we also allow people to join in for whatever reasons uh, they already care about, like the environment or uh, health issues, then it makes it a lot more easy uh, to convince people uh, to to join our club and to try to um, to be vegan for a period of time. And we experienced this in Denmark uh, when we um, got a whole parliament party, uh, yeah, from the Danish parliament to take the vegan challenge in May. And uh, we also got some uh, some uh, MPs from another party to do it as well. Uh, and this um, this was mainly because of uh, environmental um, reasons. Uh, and I think we would never have succeeded that if we just insisted on uh, getting them on board on the animal rights issue. But still, uh, this got a lot of media attention. And I know personally from talking to some of the politicians that they now also have a much better um, understanding of uh, animal rights issues and veganism. Uh, so I think it's yeah definitely a positive thing. And furthermore, this story also got... Uh, international media coverage, uh, which I think is a good thing for the movement in general, because now other um, activists in other countries can also use this um, story as a kind of milestone that uh, the politicians in Denmark are so progressive that they even went vegan for a month, and uh, and then you can try to, to push the agenda in, in your country. And furthermore, we also got some uh, some of the biggest uh, Danish celebrities to, to support and, and join the campaign. Um, people who eat meat, um, but are still finding the um, the whole um, message of the campaign uh, to be important. Uh, some vegans have um, have been um, not so happy about non-vegans promoting a vegan campaign, but I think this is um, actually it's kind of the opposite. I think because um, by having non-vegans tell other non-vegans that they should try and go vegan, I think it's much easier for people to relate to them because yeah, they're just like them. Um, so, yeah, I think it's definitely a good thing. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much uh, the end. I still have two minutes, good. Uh, then I'll um, quickly sum up. So, um, what, what can we learn from this? I think, first of all, we can learn that uh, we shouldn't shame people for being morally inconsistent uh, because of all the things I've presented to you today, it's, uh, you can't really blame people for not being 100% uh, consistent. Um, and furthermore, I think uh, it's important that we, we should strive for um, improvements rather than perfection. Um, first of all, because it's not possible to be 100% uh, morally consistent, uh, especially not when it comes to animals uh, in, in the world today, because animal abuse is so widespread uh, that animal ingredients are almost everywhere in our uh, car tires, in paint, in plastic, etc. Um, so I think it's much uh, better to... to um, to strive for improvements and look at the big picture uh, instead of getting uh, caught up in the details. Uh, and then finally, I think it's important that we focus on directing the writer uh, by providing uh, rational arguments, but that we uh, focus a lot more on uh, motivating the elephant by awakening uh, empathy for animals, uh, but definitely also um, trying to shape the path by uh, making it tasty, social, healthy, and convenient to go vegan. And if we do all those things, uh, I have the hope that we might actually end up in a world where we can uh, have our animal uh, without eating it too. Thank you. Okay, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, a comment maybe about the insects. Um, I think... Most of the time, carnists actually use the the argument that um, um, that why don't you care about insects too? Uh, and then they eat meat because they can't be perfect. So if you can't be perfect, then why bother anyway? And I think it's important to have a completely different um, view sometimes at the individual animals because at the one time they are individuals. For example, a cow is an individual. At the same time, it's also an ecosystem, uh, which, ha which has room for uh, millions of bacteria, maybe also insects, depending on how. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> and so I think that it's a bit a flawed argument to compare an individual fly with an individual cow. I think both have um, a moral uh, a right to, to not be harmed. Um, but I think it's, a, it's still a different perspective, because while both are individuals, the one is not just individual, but is also 
more individuals as a collective. So that's just the point I wanted to make. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is about evaluation. Have you um, tracked how many people have taken the challenge and are you tracking their final result? Are they sticking to their decisions or do they go back to eating meat after the 22 days? Um, yeah, we have uh, been doing some tracking, but we're, we are still working on getting it like more scientifically uh, valid. Uh, and we actually just um, signed up with uh, Veg Fund to do like a real uh, evaluation where we are going to be compared with Veganuary and one more campaign. I forgot the name. Um, but we have done our own um, um, evaluations and um, at least more than 6,000 people have been taking the challenge since uh, uh, April, uh, which I think is quite many because I think, yeah, the Danish population is around 6 million people. Um, so, of course, still a lot of people to go. Um, but yeah, around 6,000 people have uh, taken the challenge and um, we haven't done exact numbers on how many people uh, stay vegan or... Um, stuff like that but we um, and also I think it's very difficult to do these things we have only measured uh, about one week after the challenge uh, and I think much more people are eating vegan still one week after um, and many people who answer a survey it's very difficult to get people to answer them but many people who do answer are all also more likely to be positive and have made changes uh, but the picture we have seen is very positive that uh, it was only, I think, 2% of the participants who didn't move at all in a more vegan direction, where uh, many people went completely vegan, and a lot of people went vegetarian from meat eaters. And so, yeah, 98% of people moved in a more vegan direction. Um, yeah. Thank you. Just one more comment regarding uh, the E number vegans and the bees or the honeys. Uh, I do agree that E number vegans are not helping the cause. Um, not talking about honey, I disagree a little bit because it's so easy. And for E numbers, it's very hard to find which E numbers are vegan, which are not, and they're in every product, and to have a list and a book, you, we're talking about an E number book and so on. It's very, very hard to find those products where it's easy to renounce from, from honey. So uh, I agree that it, it doesn't have the biggest impact but compared to the easiness to renounce from those products, it's, it's much easier to renounce from honey because it's usually used as a sweetener, and so it's, it's very easy to replace. Whereas E numbers are not easy to replace because they're in the, in the products, and you don't know if they're vegan or not. Yeah, thanks for that comment. I, I think it's uh, yeah, definitely a valid point, and uh, you might be right about that. We have just decided that we find it more strategic to not focus on honey at this uh, point, but yeah. Yeah, thank you for your enlightening talk. I have a question concerning the time span, because there's the Vichenori, which is for one month, there's the Vegan Taste Week for a week. Wh how, why did you decide for 22 days? What went into that consideration? Um, actually, it was um, kind of uh, based on... Um, um, another campaign in uh, Israel who has uh, a vegan challenge campaign that we, we got a lot of help from them as well as some other vegan challenges uh, and they just decided on 22 days and uh, we we were like unsure if we wanted to do it for a month for 22 days and then uh, there is this uh, old folk psychological saying that it takes 21 days to change a habit uh, it's not true but uh, still a lot of people uh, say it and believe it uh, so I guess it's it kind of rings a bell with people that if it's 21 days, then you change the habit and then you continue for one more day and then you stay with the habit, I guess. Uh, yeah, we just thought that it sounded like less uh, uh, task to do it for 22 days instead of a month, but yeah. Okay, so your challenge, um, you say, I'm guessing it's like basically just based on food. Do you also give information about um, animal products like cosmetics and also like leather and things like that because obviously that as also is what makes up a vegan is you know you might as well just say vegetarian plus dairy if you're not going to include information about leather as well um, yeah that's a good question um, we have decided not to include information about the other things uh, in order to make it more doable and and easy for people to accomplish 
Um, but we, that's out of strategic reasons because we believe that if people get a good experience with uh, trying to eat vegan, uh, then they're much more likely to also include these other uh, areas and issues. And, um, and I think it's not an irrelevant fact that far most of the animals that are killed and suffer in the industry is in the food industry. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I believe it's above 90%. Uh, so it is really making a huge difference if we can get people just started on not eating animals. Uh, but it is a valid point. Okay, we can do one more. Yeah. Sorry, this is really not um, quite related to your speech. Um, but you just say the 21 days is not correct. So how many days is that? Because. Dr. New Bernard from PCRL, he says that it takes 21 days to change your habit, and he has the 21 days challenge on his website. Um, yeah, <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I've just not found any like scientific evidence that it's proven that it takes 21 days, but I mean, it could be 21 days, but it's not proven, but I guess, People also just uh, like we do. We, um, it's it seems doable to do something for 21 days, and maybe that's why people keep repeating that. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that's the best answer I have. Sorry. Okay, if you have any more questions for Simon, you can find him afterwards. Thank you for attending. Thank you.